Fred. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, the first thing is, I'm, I apologise for speaking from behind this kind of uh, Star Trek uh, module um, here, but uh, because I don't have much in the way of notes, I want to be able to glance at this screen as we go. Um, yeah, and so Steve has kind of answered a few questions for me because I, I was a bit bemused as to how and why I came to be invited. And in fact, I didn't really register exactly what it was I'd agreed to until a couple of weeks ago when I discovered that it was a seminar series in psychology and neuroscience and I had a slight wobble. Uh, when Tony, the secretary, sent me a kind of model abstract which was headed, what we can learn from brainless tadpoles, uh, my wobble kind of amplified. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, I basically, hands up, I am not a psychologist, I am not, uh, I'm certainly not a neuroscientist, I know very little about tadpoles, I, uh, I, uh, I, I, um, what I am is, is as Steve says, a, 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 well, he maybe didn't use this term, but I would use it, I'm a jobbing social researcher, I'm an applied social researcher, um, but I'm also that rare thing, a person, who, a social scientist who spent nearly an entire career outside academia. Um, so, so I say nearly, uh, nearly my entire career because I started out uh, working as a research fellow in, in criminology at Edinburgh with a, a slightly uh, deranged academic called Richard Kinsey, um, who I don't, you probably won't know, but that sent me off into... Uh, a role in the Scottish, in what was then the Central Research Unit at what was then the Scottish office, and I spent a few years uh, managing and commissioning uh, social research in the, in the field of crime and justice. Uh, with a friend, I then went to set up a social research team within uh, a commercial research organisation, what was then called System 3, is now part of a global research organisation called TNS BMRB. And as Steve says, for the last 10 years, I've worked for uh, NatSend Social Research, the National Centre for Social Research, running the Scottish end of it, which is ScotSend. So, um, I suppose, as such, well, throughout that period, I've been engaged in what you, you could call applied social research. In other words, research which is explicitly or primarily concerned with the needs of policy and practice, and to some extent, informing public debate. Um, and throughout that period as well, I guess I have been outside but alongside academia much of the way and at various points I've kind of crossed over into it. Uh, I've, I've worked with academics as collaborators, I've come up against them as competitors and we've, we've, we've drawn on, on ideas from academia and sometimes contributed them. But always from this very different start point, a different organisational starting point, a different cultural starting point and a different set of priorities and and emphases. So uh, I'm conscious that academia itself is increasingly uh, engaged with this realm of the applied, of applied social research. Um, and that's obviously driven in part by the, the kind of ideology of impact that's now institutionalized in the REF, but also by hard economic reality of uh, declining revenues and uh, the need to, to find new sources of funding. Um, so I thought you might find it interesting to, to hear some, some of my reflections on what that world looks like from my side of the fence. Um, so that's what I plan to do. So I thought I'd tell you a bit about NatSen and Scott Sen, about the kind of organisation we are um, and what we do and how we organise ourselves to do that stuff. And then I thought if there's time we could reflect a little. Oh, and also to say something about the kinds of challenges and issues that we face operating in that space. But then also if there's time to reflect a bit on on what it might, what, what the nature of academic engagement with that realm might be like. Um, whether it is in fact a realm that academia should be engaged with, and if so, how might you position yourselves better to do that? Um, so, so I'll start by telling you a bit about, about that said, what, where, where we came from as an organisation. Well, specifically, um, oh well, yeah, okay, this is a kind of pen picture of us. So in outline, we are the UK's largest independent social research institute. We have about 350 staff, about 120 of whom are researchers. Um, annual revenues of about 35 to 40 million, which I think is pretty similar to the research revenues of St Andrews, if I'm uh, right. I had a quick look online, and uh, that may be completely out. But it, it's, it, we're, a, we're a significant presence 
um, at least in the social research world as a result. So we have off our main offices in London, we have a, the office in Edinburgh, and we have in Brentwood what you could probably best describe as a survey factory, where, where they kind of turn the handles of the survey research process. Um, we have about 1,200 freelance interviewers uh, across the whole of the UK, and also a, team of, a smaller team of nurse interviewers um, who uh, are involved in, in extracting other kinds of information from people. Uh, in, in the comfort of their own homes, but with the security of the fact, they, the fact that they're properly accredited to do so. Um, and and th between them, they do about 120,000 interviews a year, which is clearly a lot, though I should say that it's not necessarily uh, as many as some of the other uh, survey organisations in the UK. Um, so, so, so at the heart of what we do is there are these large-scale social surveys, but we also have a wide range of, of other kind of methodological expertise and pockets of quite deep substantive knowledge in a few areas, not across the board. We have up to 200 live projects going on at any one time, uh, and they range in size from uh, you know, a few days desk research or consultancy up to some of these very big survey projects. Um, and the vast majority, we, we do have the ability to get money from the funding councils, but, the, but about 80% of our revenues come from contract research for public bodies. So uh, specifically central government departments, but also uh, voluntary sector and local government and so on. And a lot of that work, as Steve has suggested in relation to the Scottish government, is commissioned on a tendered basis. So, um, so you're responding competitively along with maybe four or five or sometimes 15 other organisations. And that's the bit of our work that I'll probably say most about. Now, I said I'd, I'd tell you where we came from as an organisation. And specifically, this is where we came from. This is London in 1969, um, a time when uh, Cinzano Bianco was still considered the drink of choice. And you could apparently park your car in the middle of Trafalgar Square, which I was impressed by. Um, but also, obviously, a time of great social upheaval, but also optimism, a uh, sense, general sense that the world could be made a better place. And I think infused with that spirit, a couple of young uh, market researchers called Roger Jowell and Gerard Hoynville decided to quit their jobs testing sliced bread and washing powder and so on, and to try and apply their kind of methodological skills um, in a more socially useful way. So the organisation they set up um, was initially known as Social and Community Planning Research. So you can see why they eventually changed the name to NatSen. Um, and within a few years, it became a very uh, leading presence within um, social survey research in the UK. Um, in part, that was because they, they deliberately applied uh, serious academic and social survey theory to social survey practice. They set up a survey methods centre which collaborated heavily with um, some of the academic institutions in the UK. And, and as a result, they, they were really at the forefront of a number of the kind of key developments in social survey practice, including things like the introduction of uh, computer-assisted interviewing um, and uh, the development of uh, bespoke sampling approaches for things like sampling minority ethnic households. So that, that's Roger Jow, uh, who, who remained director of NatSen until the late 90s. And the book, Survey Research Practice, was a kind of standard text, certainly within the research industry, but I think it was also widely used within academia as well. So, so, so surveys were, were the main part of the business of the organisation, but through the 80s uh, and onwards, qualitative research was also a very significant presence. Um, Natsen established a qualitative research unit in 1985, which did a, an awful lot to promote the acceptability of qualitative research methods within policy research circles because yeah, policy makers traditionally had quite a lot of uh, suspicion of qualitative research. They saw it as very subjective. They thought they needed numbers to win arguments and so on. Um, QRU, um, uh, one of the things that QRU did was it developed uh, it, uh, or a, a sort of systematic and codified approach to the, qualitative to the analysis of qualitative data, which it called framework. Um, and that became also very influential, widely used within policy research circles, but also within pockets of academia. Um, we subsequently turned that into a kind of software program for use within that SEN, 
and eventually a commercial version of that was launched, I have to say, remarkably unsuccessfully. I think we proved to ourselves that we should stick to the day job and, uh, and leave software development to other people. And in fact, what then happened was that it was incorporated into uh, some of the most recent releases of QSR and Vivo, which any of the qualitative researchers amongst you will know is the kind of Microsoft of uh, qualitative data analysis. Um, so where Scott Sen fits in, uh, Nat Sen always did bits and pieces of work in Scotland, but usually as part of UK-wide projects. Following devolution, I think uh, they reasonably uh, thought we can't really call ourselves the National Centre for Social Research and not engage with this whole new environment that was opening up. So an office was opened in Edinburgh, but uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a bit half assed to be honest. There were two, two people and a, and a director splitting their time between London and Edinburgh, uh, and it didn't really um, gain much traction. Uh, in 2003, I was appointed as a full-time director, and the following year, we had the chance to take over a small independent research consultancy called Scottish Health Feedback, which we did, and with the result that we, at one fell swoop, kind of gained critical mass, uh, additional methodological skills, uh, an order book of, of ongoing work, and, um, and a kind of engagement with some substantive areas that they were very strong in, particularly public health. And so that gave us a very good launch pad. Um, and from there, we, we grew to a present kind of size of about 18 staff and um, around 15 projects at any one time and revenues of between two and three million. Um, so uh, I said that the organization was launched with, against this kind of sense of social optimism and um, belief that you can make the world a better place. And it was also deliberately established and remains as an educational charity. Um, governed by a board of trustees um, who contain some of the good and the great of UK social science or have done over the years. Sir Klaus Moser, uh, who was an uh, eminent social statistician, Sir Howard Newby, Ian Diamond's currently on there, um, Paul Wiles, who was head of research at the Home Office, Janet Finch was head of trustees until relatively recently. Um, so that's one very important set of stakeholders for us. Um, but the other, the other thing is, as a charity, we are obliged to deliver and to demonstrate public benefit. Uh, the Charities Commission expects it. We have to show that we deliver public benefit through the work that we do. Um, and that explains our slightly tacky um, strap line, which is social research that works for society. And I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. So on the one hand, we are this charitable entity with the commitment to public benefit. On the other hand, however, as the joke at the top says, we're not for profit, but we're not for loss either, because we have no core funding. All of the revenues that, that pay for the uh, organization come from the projects that we do. As you can imagine, raising 35 or 40 million pounds in project funding every year is a big task. Um, so, and we have big organizational overheads to pay for, this survey machinery, uh, a whacking great pension deficit, and, um, and we have to operate in a highly commercial uh, research environment. So we are regularly competing with, um, we, we sometimes compete with academics, but far more often we're competing with commercial consultancies and, and commercial research organizations who are very slick, very well organized, and have global resources behind them these days. Um, sometimes people, refer to us as, as a think tank. We're not a think tank. Um, if anything, we're a fact tank, uh, with apologies for the slightly crude use of the word fact there. But um, we, we are really about ensuring that public policy and public debate is informed and underpinned by the best quality available evidence. Uh, we're not about promoting or pushing particular policy perspectives. Um, we are independent and politically neutral. That's a very important part of what we do. And we try to promote intelligent engagement with how research is carried out. So in, in equipping people to engage with discussions about how, can you, how, how should I interpret this? What use should I make of this information knowing uh, how, it's been, how the research has been conducted? And a nice example of that is the website that we currently are running called What Scotland Thinks which is a kind of one-stop shop for information about 
public attitudes and opinions in relation to independence and the referendum. Um, and that contains uh, commentary by us on the latest polls, uh, not so much, uh, it's certainly not from one perspective or the other, but simply in terms of how might you interpret these uh, and what questions do you need to ask of how they've been carried out. Um, and just briefly, the, the other aspect of our work is, which ties back to the educational charity uh, stuff, is that we have a kind of learning and capacity building arm, um, which, which runs a series of, of uh, bespoke and modular courses uh, on a whole range of topics. But the difference between those and the courses that you might come across at, at St Andrews or in a, any other academic setting is that they're very much grounded in our in our own experience of doing applied empirical research. They're taught by the people who do the work within that SEN, um, which is where the, the strap line for that sharing our experience comes from. So that's the kind of organization we are, the kind of work we do. I've already said we do a lot of large scale social survey projects. I'll just give you a sense of what they're like. Um, they range from uh, very large data collection projects where the kind of investigator team sits elsewhere. So understanding society, for example, is, has anybody, any of you heard of understanding society? No, it's the UK's largest social science project. It's a massive cohort survey um, based on 40,000 households. The investigator, it's funded by the SRC, the investigator teams at the University of Essex. NatSEN held the contract for the field work for that for the first five years. Um, a contract that was worth in excess of about 20 million, I think. Um, uh, but we, we were responsible for implementing and delivering data, but not for any other aspects of the study. ELSA, the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, we are part of the investigator team as well on that. So we're involved in design and, and analysis and outputs too. And then something like growing up in Scotland, uh, that is very much our study. There is, we are the investigator team, but we're also the, uh, the data collection organisation. And the academic input is brought in much more on a kind of consultancy basis. They are not co-investigators in the same way. Growing up in Scotland is uh, a multi-cohort study uh, which follows um, group, uh, several thousand um, children and their families from birth through the early years and beyond. Um, and it's funded by the Scottish Government, has an explicit focus on, on policy. Um, the social attitude surveys have been running in, in, in across the UK as a whole since the early 80s, in Scotland since 99. Um, and uh, NATSAL is the... Um, National Survey of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles. It's a study which was famously um, rescued by the Wellcome Trust in the early 80s after Margaret Thatcher refused to fund it because I think she thought it was vaguely or possibly very obscene. Um, uh, so anyway, th those are the kinds of, of survey projects we do. Um, we do a lot of evaluation um, and have done, especially since Labour came to power in the, uh, in the uh, uh, late, late 90s. Um, there is a small number of very large experimental random controlled trial type impact evaluations in there. So for example, the evaluation of the free school meals pilot for the Department for Education, or these RCTs that we're currently doing down south that are looking at the impact of some numeracy and literacy uh, programs. But we also do a large number of these much smaller scale mixed method evaluations um, and uh, there are a couple of, they're mainly focused on process and implementation and early outcomes. Um, and a couple of examples there from Scott Sen's recent work. Um, some of the stuff we do is out and out qualitative. It's not evalu evaluation, evaluative in character. Um, so for example, a very big study that we did for the cabinet office, exploring the causes and, and immediate consequences of the 2011 riots. Um, that was actually published in November 2011, following the riots in the August. And so it gives you a sense of, of our ability to kind of uh, turn something round, um, engage with it very quickly, get something up and running. Uh, the online grooming project is, involves interviews with individuals who've been convicted of uh, online sexual offences. Um, the Children's Hearing System, the current Scotsend one, where we're talk talking to children, 
as you would imagine, about what it feels like to go through that process. So those are some of the kind of qualitative projects we, we do or have done. And then there's other stuff. There's desk research, there's methodological and scoping work. Uh, there's obviously increasing emphasis on secondary analysis and to some extent on, on systematic and other kinds of reviews, although I have, to, I have to confess we're not well placed to do those because we don't have access to the right kinds of information resources. So how do we do the work we do? Um, essentially, I, I've already used the language of the factory, um, essentially we run a big research production line. Um, we have a complex division of labour with a high degree of specialisation within it. So the researchers come in at the points that they need to be involved in the project and then we have specialist teams who do the other aspects of it. So this isn't a very pretty diagram but it will give you some sense of it. So the project is specified, the researchers are heavily involved in the research design end of it uh, along with uh, colleagues who work in project computing so they would be scripting a questionnaire to, to go out on uh, interviewer laptops. We'd probably also have input from survey methodologists and survey statisticians within the organisation at that point. It, the data collection phase is run from Brentwood. Uh, the field management and operations and logistics is all handled by the, the, uh, the team down there. Um, we have, uh, within Brentwood and London, we have separate teams of people who will do data preparation and cleaning and management of data sets so that it then comes back to you ready to do the, the analysis and reporting at the end. Um, so what that means, of course, is that people can work on multiple projects at any one time. Um, and, uh, but also, it, the, the, the survey part of our work is very high volume. Um, there is a very high level of capital investment in it because all of the interviewers are carrying laptops. We need to license 1,200 of them. We need to train them and so on. Um, and so, so we benefit from economies of scale associated with that. It also means, frankly, that there are incredibly high barriers to entry for, for, that, for that kind of work now. Uh, I don't know when the last time anyone launched a new social survey field force was, but it must be at least 15 years ago, because as soon as it went to computer-based interviewing, uh, it required a very big investment to get a field force off the ground in the first place. But it also means, this stuff also means that traditionally you, you, you have to work in relatively fixed ways and with relatively standardised approaches. So, you know, you can have any survey you want as long as it's black, that kind of... Um, problem uh, and it also traditionally has relied on having staff who are methodologically specialist and substantively generalist so researchers who have this kind of toolkit of of survey methods that they can come and apply to any subject and that doesn't always work and for reasons I'll say in a minute it's kind of breaking down a bit um, but the other kind of key features and areas in which there's a really clear contrast with the world of academic research are first of all that we employ permanent research staff, um, people who come in to, to work for us even as graduate trainees, at the end of their first year they go on to a permanent contract and the expectation is that they will progress through a clear career structure which basically has four or five rungs on it. Um, we invest heavily in their ongoing um, training and development partly because we need to train them in the ways that we do things or in the ways of actual hands-on applied empirical research, not textbook research. Um, and the two things aren't always the same. Um, and, it, and I have to say that anybody who's worked in a research agency setting, whether it's in the private sector or like us in the sort of not-for-profit sector, will tell you that it's a remarkably collegiate environment. Um, I, my partner is an academic, so I, I'm very familiar with, with kind of academic culture as well. And I've, I've always been struck by the, by the contrast between, uh, even when I was in the private sector, the sort of sense of collegiality and uh, collaborative working that I found in, the, in, in my research environment with the highly individualised, even, you know, slightly atomistic kind of environment that, that seemed to exist in, in university research. Um, but the, but the flip side of that is that people have much less 
freedom to choose what it is they want to do. So as an organisation, we make decisions about what we're going to go for and then we apply people to those projects. Uh, it is possible to some extent to cultivate an area of interest and, uh, but far, far more limited uh, kind of discretion than you would have within an academic context. Um, okay, I'm just, I'll rattle on. Um, so, some of the, the kind of trends and challenges in this world from where I sit. The first one uh, won't surprise you at all. It's financial um, and it relates to the, to the, uh, the rise and then subsequent fall of, of uh, evidence-based policy making or spending on it anyway. So, so what we saw post-97 was a massive increase in expenditure on social policy research. And as a result, NatSen, along with everyone else, floated on this tide. Uh, you know, we probably went from annual revenues of maybe 12 million in, in the late 90s to 40 million by the end of the, the, you know, the following decade. Um, and that's because the government made major investments in large-scale household surveys, but also uh, big programs of evaluation. Many of those were multi-year, multi-million pound projects as well. But what's happened, of course, is that since 2010, uh, there have been major spending reductions. Um, and those, I mean, it's partly just simple finances, economics, uh, but it's also been reinforced by the return of conviction and coalition politics um, in both London and Westminster. Uh, you know, we have, we have ministers who have no personal commitment to the notions of evidence in policy making. Uh, they, they often feel it's sufficient that this is what their constituents are saying. Um, and, uh, and coalition politics as well takes the wind out of the sails of evaluation research in particular because coalitions simply do less. There is less need for evidence and less call for evaluation in particular. But, but to give you a sense of how, how that's kind of infected the culture, I was speaking to a guy in the Scottish Government recently about police reform. Now, I have a bit of a bee in my bonnet about police reform. It's the biggest single public sector reform initiative in, in living memory in Scotland. And, uh, and they went into it uh, at breakneck speed without putting in place any proper baseline of information around public experience, attitudes, uh, and, and other things that might help them to reflect down the line or uh, on whether it or not it had been a success or even to improve the process as it went along. And I was uh, bemoaning this, the, the absence of this kind of investment um, in, a, in, in kind of baseline evaluation uh, to uh, an analyst in the Scottish Government. And he said, yeah, I think the problem is the policymakers just have this feeling that knowing things takes time. And I said, sorry? And he said, I mean, I think he meant two things by it. One, one I agree with, knowing things, learning things does take time. But the other thing which absolutely took my breath away and left me incredibly depressed was that he meant that the more you know, the more complicated things are and the more difficult it is to do them. And I found that profoundly depressing. Um, anyway, uh, so, so what you have across the public sector as a whole, and central government, local government, uh, all the, the markets that we operate in, is a kind of agenda of more, with, more for less. Um, there's an expectation that uh, you should be able to do more with your existing data sets. Um, secondary analysis, systematic review, etc. I mean, that's fair enough. I mean, to be honest, the government has invested millions in collecting data and hardly anything in using a lot of it. So I'm all in favor of that. But uh, you can't stop collecting data because eventually you're, you, 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 know, you can't just carry on doing secondary reviews and, and um, systema systematic reviews and secondary analysis because eventually you'll run out of data to do that on. Um, and, and also what we've seen is, you know, we, we in a, on a Monday meeting, when we review the, the specifications that come through, the invitations to tender, uh, the phrase, that's another moon on a stick one, is bandied around often. A, a colleague of mine used to, used to have a variant on it, was, which was, uh, yeah, and I'll have a flake with that too, thanks. Um, because people just think that in the current climate, they should be able to get ridiculous amounts 
for their investment, as I think Steve will recall from our discussions about the uh, uh, sectarianism project. So what that leads to, obviously, is extreme price competition. And uh, we went through a fairly bloody period a couple of years ago where uh, organisations were, were basically buying work to stay afloat. And, of course, that doesn't work for anybody because some of them then went under uh, while they were in the process of, of trying to deliver them. Um, this is... I, I, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if, I, if even I quite believe these figures. I put them together from some stuff I found on the Scottish Government website the other day. Lists of projects commissioned in the financial years 2006-07 through to 2011-12. The column on the right is the total number of projects. The column, uh, uh, sorry, the column on the left. The column on the right is the number of projects over 40,000. And underneath you can see their total spend on social research in any of those years. Now, the total spend in 2007-08 uh, is in massively inflated because they commissioned the Scottish Health Survey that year, which had a budget of £7 million. Um, but, uh, but basically, you can see that it's just been decimated. And in 2011-12, we reached a situation where they commissioned just 19 projects, and only four of them were worth more than 40 k Now, I think that these figures are slightly distorted. I certainly... My impression is that 2012-13 was better, uh, but you get the general picture. This is a completely transformed environment in terms of the uh, appetite for an expenditure on evidence. So, um, I was going to say the, the older members of the audience, but I think it's probably just you two, <laughs> <laughs> may remember the banana splits. And uh, there was a cartoon um, as part of this kids' programme where there was a character who could transform himself at will by, sh by uttering the word size of an elephant. And he could turn himself into an elephant, size of a mouse. And actually, that's the kind of flexibility that you now need because what's been left are a small number of these very large mammoth so survey projects and then lots of these very small projects that require a very high degree of flexibility. Um, you know, you need to be able to turn the tenders round very quickly. I mean, to respond to them very quickly. We got one last week, which I think actually originated in St Andrews at Karu, where they put it out and they wanted the tenders back within five days. Um, uh, there was also an issue with the budget, but I won't go on about it. Um, you have to, so you have to respond very quickly. You have to turn them around very quickly. Uh, you have to be more, more creative in the kind of approaches you offer. Um, and so on. And of course you need to pursue new different sources of revenue. Um, so, so all of this poses various challenges to the way that we work. Um, it makes it more difficult to sustain this kind of the balance between the methodological and the substantive because a lot of this smaller scale stuff requires you to really understand the policy areas you're working in. A lot of it is much closer to the policy process than the kind of large scale survey work that we might once have been doing. Uh, and so one of our responses to that has been to go from a structure based on methods where we had a survey research team and a qualitative research team to one which is based around policy areas. Um, so this is our crime and justice team based in London. They do have some very high level expertise in certain areas, particularly around uh, sexual offending, uh, victims and witnesses. But it's impossible with a team of that size to be able to cover the, the, the breadth of a policy area like crime and justice, uh, to, do it just, to do it justice, if you'll excuse the pun. Um, and also, we find ourselves having to offer a much wider range of methodological approaches. So, instead of just the kind of one-size-fits-all survey and quality work, this is the kind of current range of, of methods that we're working with. And obviously, some of those we're much more comfortable and familiar with than others, but it's hard to work at a sustained level of, of expertise across that whole range. Um, I should say that the one down at the bottom, Web, is emerging as as really critical to the survey end of things as well. Not because web-based online surveys are replacing face-to-face -face surveys, but because mixed mode is the way that a lot of these big survey projects are going, particularly the longitudinal studies. So you recruit people face-to-face, -face, you maybe do the initial interviews like that, you then switch them to web or telephone follow-up. Um, 
and that requires a kind of technical technical infrastructure which is surprisingly hard to to uh, manage and and expensive too um, and and finally of course with smaller uh, projects with fewer large-scale survey projects um, it, it it's very staff intensive it's staff intensive to win them because you, you have to put nearly as much time into winning a £50,000 project as you do a £500,000 one. And it's very expensive to do them because they tend to be all about researcher time. So £50,000 might translate into uh, 100 days of researcher time. Um, whereas, you know, on a survey, that would... Uh, you, 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 most of the money would be going through the, the field work end of things. OK, so... Briefly, some other, some other issues that... Uh, I once did a talk a bit like this, and somebody afterwards said to me, you should have just called it, and another thing I hate. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so, I, I, it's not that I hate it. I do understand why these things happen, but, uh, but this is just, I, as I say, the world I live in. Um, what we've seen over the last decade is the rise of, of procurement-led commissioning. So, uh, highly bureaucratic highly inflexible uh, systems for commissioning research projects through government, often involving multiple stages, maybe a first stage where you have to submit all your annual accounts for three years and your HR policy, and, your, uh, and then you make it onto the short list and then they send you the, the invitation to tender. Um, very little scope for engaging with them about what exactly did you mean, and did you, re uh, because because they, they want to ensure an entirely level playing field. So they say, you must submit all questions through the electronic portal, and they will be circulated to all bidders. And, and so, of course, you're reluctant to do it, because often that, that shows you a hand um, in relation to some kind of key element of the design. Um, and it's all often led by individuals who are used to commissioning, um, to buying bricks, filing cabinets, toilets, not research. Um, and finally, as, as Steve experienced, uh, it's, actually very, it's actually quite formula-driven. Um, they, they use things, they use a system called meat scores, uh, most economically advantageous tender. They score you in quality, they then give you a total quality score and divide it by your price. And on that basis, we scored something like 0 0.00076 instead of 00077 for the successful tender on that project. And that was a perverse outcome because they knew they had £80,000 to do the work. We said, we will design you the best project we can for £80,000. Somebody designed them a slightly less good project, but they put it in at 70000 And so they went with the project that was 70000 That cannot be the right outcome, in my view. Um, anyway. Uh, I'm going to just maybe skip through these because I, I, I want to leave some time um, to have a chat about academia as well. But other things that have been around for us, the, these, these are other ways in which the, the procurement environment is changing. Um, ethical frameworks have rightly become much more demanding, but they can, that can actually tip into being overly restrictive, can prevent you from doing good work in my view, and ethical work. Um, government departments are incredibly twitchy these days about data security, particularly the ones who've left things in taxis. And, um, uh, and as a result, they require us, or some of them, DWP for example, is auditing my colleagues in London today to ensure that they are adhering to this particular uh, set of, of data security protocols, which involve uh, things like all of our laptops, all of our recording devices, all of our data sticks are all encrypted. Um, I, uh, I had to blatantly flout that by borrowing one from my dad today. <laughs> uh, because, we, you know, this stuff is, is now taken extremely seriously. I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying it's part of what you have to live with if you're working in this world. Um, risk management, the whole language of risk has permeated research commissioning. You have to submit risk assessment tables where you say what the likelihood of something happening is, what the impact of it is, what the, the, uh, uh, the contingency plans you have in place are, and so on. Um, very, very time consuming. 
Ultimately, I doubt that anybody looks at it beyond the procurement stage, but it's part of the scoring process. And external quality assurance. Um, we now are also signed up to ISO 2252, which is the International Standard for Market and Social Research, uh, which means that we are heavily proceduralized and every year we are audited by um, people from ISO who come in and ask for evidence of sign-off on all documents and uh, where things have been kept and uh, that things have been done in particular ways. Again, not a bad thing in itself, but quite demanding and potentially a barrier uh, if you're coming at this stuff from a different kind of institutional setting. So I said that that we have to deliver public benefit. We talk about social research that works for society. Um, what does that actually mean? Uh, traditionally within that saying, I think we thought it was enough to do really high quality social research and to write really worthy 200 page reports and that that delivered public benefit in and of itself. Obviously, that's not the case. And along with everyone else, we've got increasingly angsty about imp impact and focused on the communicative as well as the scientific aspects of our work. Um, uh, and, but, but it's different. It's, the drivers are different for us. It's not about REF. It's about our charitable status. It's about the trustees saying, we don't think you're doing enough to deliver public benefit. Uh, I think it's raised some issues for me. We've invested heavily on a, on a communications team. We now have a, a dedicated comms person in the office in Edinburgh, uh, which is great um, because they're able to, to push our stuff out there in ways that we simply didn't have time to do otherwise. But it does raise questions for me about the difference between profile or, and impact and you know, getting ourselves into the mail on Sunday I don't see as being impact. Uh, in fact, it could even be the reverse of impact in some way in that you know, some, some media outlets are notorious for putting their own spins on things, distorting your findings and so on. So, uh, so impact itself is of course much more difficult to capture, much more unpredictable, plays out over a potentially very long time frame. Um, and, uh, and so we're grappling, as I know academia is, with the problem of how you capture that stuff. Um, in principle, we have a, a great starting point because all our work is in the applied realm. Um, you know, so our impact narrative, if we had one, would be, would be very good, but, but it's not straightforward. And the other thing is that a lot of the funders that we work for, surprisingly, aren't necessarily that keen on impact. So when you do work for the Scottish government, they, they, they want impact, but they want, imp they want to have a very tight control over that. They, they will never, in my experience, they'll never say to you, you cannot write that, or you know, they, they, they don't force you to, to shape your results in any way, but they will jealously guard the publication uh, of a piece of research. But having said that, once they've published it, you're pretty much free to do what you want. It's politic to let them know you're going to do it, but uh, you, can, you can work further with it. The problem is, move along please, that's the problem. We all have to move along because this, the next project is chapping the door and, and that kind of long-term engagement with the work we do is very difficult to achieve. <coughs> Though I should say, I think it's also increasingly difficult to achieve for academics, but we may come back to that. Uh, okay. Um, just last thing I'll say is, um, yeah, where does this, all this, what does all this mean for, for the quality of, of research that's commissioned? Um, if, if, if somebody asks me what I think good quality social research is, I tend to, I have a four word answer, which is method, substance, impact, ethics. And, and by that I mean it's kind of methodologically rigorous, it's substantively or theoretically informed, it's ethically conducted and it's effectively communicated. Um, but unfortunately, that's not always the, the view or the priorities 
of the research commissioners who often are much more focused on the kind of value for money risk dimensions and even within those kind of four boxes you have to you have to kind of work out in each case which is going to take priority and sometimes they are more interested in impact and far less interested in methods and and you have to be comfortable working with those different configurations okay that was that was what i wanted to say about the world of applied social research from from where i sit and i guess i was hoping that you might uh, have some observations about how academia engages with it. Um, whether you feel it's the kind of work that academics should be doing, uh, and if so, what are the things that stop you and what might you do differently or better and so on. But I'm also happy to answer any questions. Yeah.